forward. Uh, we are coming to the final session we have uh, in today's symposium by Sri Raghu Anantanarayan Ji. And he'll be speaking on the topic, the practice of Shraddha and Bhakti in the Yoga Sutras. And the earlier we saw a Shastric perspective on the Yoga Sutras uh, and Bhakti. Now Raghu Ji will be sharing a practical, experiential perspective on the same. Uh, just a brief introduction. Um, Sri Raghu Anantanarayanan Ji is a behavioral scientist, yoga teacher and an author. He has dedicated his life to the study and application of yoga and Indic traditions to guide the inner transformation of individuals and shape uh, leadership and culture uh, building of organizations. The chief quest in Raghu's work has been the classic Indic query, how to continually look within, transform, be better and inspire. This seeking led to a disciplineship with Yogacharya, Krishnamacharya, dialoguing with J. Krishnamurti and collaborating with Professor Puling K. Gar. Uh, Raghuji understood the bridge between the body and the mind, individual and the group, the traditional and the modern, which has shaped his self-inquiry throughout his life. Using Patanjali's Yoga Sutra as a guiding light, he has developed an experiential self-learning process through reflective conversations meditative practices and dialogues in groups and uh, he has combined the you know this process work with knowledge of management systems to develop unique methodologies like the learning theater totally aligned organization as well as their ten, uh, tensegrity mandala model to guide corporations and cultural organizations and his books include, uh, he has written many books. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in engineering from IIT Madras. And uh, his books include Learning Through Yoga, The Totally Aligned Organization, Leadership Dharma, Arjuna, The Timeless Metaphor, Antaranga Yoga, The Foundation of Indian Psychology, The Five Seats of Power. And he has co-authored Organizational Development and Alignment, The Tensegrity Mandala. He co-founded the Sumedhas Academy of Human Context and Barefoot Academy of Governance with TIS. He is one of the directors of the Center for Consciousness and Inner Transformation and the director of Flame Tau Nowhere Private Limited. And he serves on the board of many organizations. He is actively engaged with building Ritambara Ashram, a collective for inner transformation as its chief mentor. He lives in Neil Greece, South India. Go ahead, sir. Uh, One small correction, Nitin. He is the co-founder of Center for Consciousness Studies and Inner Transformation. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Nitin ji. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I... Om Yogena Chittasya Padena Vacham. Malam Shari Rasya Chavaitya Kena Yo Pakarotam Pravaram Muninam Patanjalim Pranjali Rana Tosmi Abahu Purushakaram Shanka Chakra Sidharinam <coughs> Sahasra Shirasam Shvetam Pranamami Patanjalim Shrimate Anantaya Nagarajaya Namo Namaha Om Shri Krishna Vagi Shayati Shwarabhyam Samprapta Chakrankana Bhashyasaram Shri Nut Narangendra Yatau Samarpitaswam Shri Krishna Maryam Guru Varyamide Virode Kartike Mase Shatatara Krito Dayam Yoga Charyam Krishna Maryam Guru Varyamaham Bhaje Shri Guru Pyo Namaha what I'm going to do is uh, share with you people uh, what I've understood from the Yoga Sutras and especially or particularly as I've learned it from my Guru, 
ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣಮಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕೀ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ಯೋಗ ಸೂತ್ರ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅನ್ ಅನುಶಾಸನ ಸೂತ್ರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ಸೇ ಅನುಶಾಸನ ಸೂತ್ರ ವಿ ಮೀನ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ and we accept whatever we do through our practice so while the starting point in the yoga sutra states it clearly while the starting point is the agama and in our tradition agama means the way your teacher reveals the book or the shastra to you then there is anumana and pratyaksha now one of the key things that krishnamacharya would repeat is that when even if i am listening to krishnamacharya he is sitting there in front of me and speaking what i grasp in my mind may or may not be exactly what is being said so the truth as i hold it of what is being taught is mine and may not necessarily be that of what is being said because my mind may not have the clarity and the capability to grasp completely so anumana and pratyaksha become very important because i have to then practice and through my practice i will have more and more clear glimpses of what is being said and since the association with the teacher is for a long period of time one is able to clarify this understanding quite often through one's questions or whatever the teacher also grasps how much has been understood and then the teacher will really reveal deeper and deeper aspects of the truth so my understanding definitely therefore is a work in progress yeah so these are the claimers and disclaimers of what i'm going to say now i'm going to speak mainly about the as two aspects na shraddha and bhakti with respect to the yoga sutras and for this one has to understand the basic structure of the yoga sutras itself and this structure is repeated several times in the yoga sutra in different ways in the second chapter this is explicitly stated so it uses four very important words the first word that it uses is heyam now the word heyam is very important because uh normally one is living in the world which is a world of samskara sorry samsara where you are experiencing the world you are falling you are getting up your ups and downs and so on but you don't recognize that this is a an existence filled with dukha that's called the first viveka so when you re- realize that you're living in a way that ought not to be lived the world becomes heyam become it becomes that which has to be avoided so the way i'm living and the way i'm experiencing the world i have to look at carefully and i have to start making some changes so that dukkha can be ended so heyam dukham anagatam so then it talks about heya hetu there is a certain context in which i get caught with life living life in a certain way so there's a whole description of avidya and how avidya causes us to live in a way that we keep creating dukha for ourselves and then there is a state beyond this called hanam hanam is defined differently in different chapters but they fundamentally mean the same thing it means a state where you realize clearly the distinction between purusha and prakriti and become anchored in the drashta or the purusha that is the hanam and there is a hana upaya so most of the yoga sutras is about different types of hana upaya so the practice here is all of these the first is to look at the world and say am i living a life where i'm creating dukkha for myself then to understand 
what actions, what state of mind, what inner uh, feeling, re repetitive patterns and so on is causing this dukkha for me. To have an understanding, hopefully a clear insight in the beginning of this other state that is possible. And then there are so many practices given to move from here to there. Okay. So in the first chapter, for example, the illumined self is very clearly stated as drashta and the required or the, the aspired for state is an anchorage in drashta. Yeah. Tada drashtuhu swarupe avasthanam. And the heyam state is sarupyam. Pritti sarupyam itaratra. And the movement between these two. In the second chapter, it's stated slightly differently. In the second half of the first chapter itself, it's stated differently and so on. So this is the basic structure of the Yoga Sutras. Now, one of the critical things to keep in mind in this whole process is that there is a certain clarity of mind itself required to understand each of these states and each of these practices. So the Yoga Sutra is actually divided into four parts and Krishnamacharya would half jokingly say that each part of the Yoga Sutra is meant for a different person. So the first part up till the Ishwara Pranidhana chapter, uh, Pranidhana Sutra is meant for a person whom he called Mastakanjali. And he would say that when uh, Patanjali was talking about yoga and he came up to the sutra, Mastakanjali had a complete illumination. He got up and he said, thank you, and he walked away. And the other people stayed behind for the other instructions. So I'm just going to tell you basically what he spoke about na, on this. So the first set of sutras till the Ishwara Pranidhana Sutra is supposed to be for people who are bhava pratyayas. And these are people who have already an extremely clear, lucid mind. They're very deeply anchored in themselves. But for some reason, they need this extra spark to be reminded of the states that they had already achieved in their previous birth. So they are born with a certain extraordinary mind. So for these people, the Yoga Sutra does not bring in the idea of Ishwara. So it goes straight from telling you what is yoga, what is the state of Drashtaha, Swarupe Avasthanam, what is uh, chitta vritti, how do you end chitta vritti? And it talks about abhyasam and vairagyam, abhyasa vairagya, abhyam tannirodaha, and so on. So, this is straight, direct, and very, very sharp set of sutras that tell you what's the nature of the world, what's the nature of the mind, what's the nature of purusha, and how do you get anchored completely in purusha. Right? We'll come back to why uh, Nirishwara and so on a uh, little later. <clears throat> and then it also talks about Itaratra. Itaratra generally refers to people who are called Upaya Pratyaya. Upaya Pratyaya are all of us. We need a method. We have to develop a mind capable of clear seeing invest in that mind over a period of time so that this psyche, mind is a bad, is a wrong word, and the whole prakriti has to change. So this prakriti then becomes capable of sustained samadhi and therefore realizing what is kaivalya and all of the guna uh, atitan. He becomes a guna atitan and so on. So even in the upaya pratyaya, there are three levels. And why does an Upaya Pratyaya need Ishwara? So Krishnamacharya is very clear about it. He says, in the Kali Yuga, you must have 
Ishwara with you. Without Ishwara, you cannot transcend. And the reason is this. <clears throat> In Kali Yuga, we uh, reinforce avidya. And avidya consists of not just a mistaken understanding of the nature of the world around you, it also fundamentally creates a mistaken construct of the self. I create a structure of feeling, thought, and action, and live inside this structure of thought, feeling, and action. And this structure is both a protective, defensive structure, as well as an acquisitive machine. So it goes after things that it thinks is pleasurable, which is raga, and defends itself against things which it thinks it's dvesha. And this structure then becomes filled with an energy called abhinivesha, which is self-protective. This has to uh, live. So all my energies, all my capabilities I bring in and fill this avidya kshetram and the avidya structure with this energy of self-preservation, acquisition, exploitation, and so on. And what then happens is, as we start practicing yoga, we realize that this structure is what is blinding me, both from my reality of who I am and the reality of the world as it is. But when we come to the edge and we really have to dissolve or drop this sense of self, Abhinivesha comes up and captures us. So the only way I can allow this sense of self to drop away is if Ishwara is there to help me. While the first person, the Mastakanjali, did not need it. He saw this structure. He said this is a false structure. He just burnt it off. For others, it becomes at this edge, you get into fear and you really reinforce the old structures again. So Ishwara then becomes an extremely important part of the Upaya. Okay. And then there are different levels of Upaya that you need. So one description of Ishwara is very similar to Ishwara as Pragna Swarupam. Sa Esha Purve Shamapi Guru Kalena Navachedat and so on. And when the slightly more advanced sadhaka is told that this is the form of Ishwara, his mind is capable of absorbing this idea which does not have form, but which is directly a description of consciousness and transcendent states of being. And because he has trust, he has shraddha. Now, English words are very uh, problematic here. He has shraddha in this understanding of Ishwara. He becomes capable of dropping the structures of the mind and therefore becomes capable of nirbija samadhi. Yeah? Now, then there is the person for whom this understanding of Ishwara uh, doesn't evoke because his mind is not capable, his mind is not subtle enough. So for this person, Ishwara is described as the ground of all being. Yeah, And then this person needs to go through a process of self-study. This person needs to go through a uh, more rigorous practice. And for this person, understanding that everything around him is actually a form of Ishwara becomes a very, very critical way of being able to then look at the world differently a way, in a way that doesn't create Dukkha and slowly dissolve his sense of Asmita or sense of self completely. And then you have the person who is even more uh, tamasic in a sense, who needs even deeper practices, even more fundamental practices of how to behave, what is uh, right conduct, 
in various situations, asana, pranayama, good food, and all of this. For this sadhaka, Ishvara is a personal God and a protector. He needs a vigraha. He needs a clear form to be given. And he develops a certain relationship with this form. And through that is able to set aside his asmita. And the more he's able to set aside his asmita, for longer time he's able to set aside his asmita, the inner intelligence and his own svabhava and his own inter inner intelligence start to manifest. So that is the context in which Shraddha is talked about. We also need to keep in mind that the word yoga in the Yoga Sutra refers both to the path that one is taking as well as the end point. Yeah? So there are a couple of sutras that clearly use the word Shraddha. Now one of the Sutras is Shraddha Virya Smriti Samadhi Prajna Purvaka Itaresham. I mentioned that word Itaresham for you before earlier. So the people who need Upaya Pratyaya need to understand Shraddha Virya. I'll explain all these words to you. Now Shraddha in this context uh, is towards both the path and the certainty of the end. And Shraddha Krishnamacharya would describe the easiest way of understanding Shraddha is the way a mother continuously invests in the child, knowing full well that all my investments will lead to the child becoming a beautiful adult, is the quality of Shraddha. So I invest in my practice, I invest in my end point, the goal. And I continuously keep the practice because initially an upaya pratyaya is not going to experience the phala of the practice, right? And then the sutras also talk about what kind of problems will come up, vyadhi, styana, samshaya, pramada, and various things like this. What kind of dukkha, daurmanasya it will create. So when these Vignas come, unless I have this complete Shraddha, I'm not going to keep on investing. So it's like a child. The child might fall ill. The child will sometimes listen to you. The child will not listen to you and so on. But you keep on investing in the child. Then Virya. Virya is very important because you need a certain courage to walk on this path. Yeah, because initially when a person makes a commitment, the person does not actually have a clear, insightful idea of the end point. His teacher tells him something inside him says, I have to be on the path. So he gets onto the path. And when you start walking on the path, you have to be able to see what is it in yourself that is causing Dukkha. In modern terminology, they call it the shadow sides of the self. So I have to look at my behavioral patterns and go through what is called Karya Vimukti first, and then I have to go through Chitta Vimukti and so on. So Karya Vimukti itself requires a lot of intensity and courage. I have to stop doing certain actions that I know is creating Dukkha. I have to invest in actions which I know will lead me to the final end. Then I have to understand what is the mind that is compulsively going behind this negative. Yeah, so if you remember in the Mahabharata, Krishna reveals himself to Duryodhana. Duryodhana clearly says, I can see you, but my mind is so full of envy, I can't follow what you're saying. So his, the ability that you need, the prakriti that you need to follow this path with courage, even when negative parts of me get revealed to myself is virya. Now, smriti is a very interesting word. Smriti means two things. One is I have to keep track of my own practice. I have to keep track of what my teacher has said so that I can move on the path. And when I see indicators 
that I have walked a certain distance and got to a certain goal or phala, I'll be able to recognize it. That is one aspect of prakriti. So I can build on my practice. I know that I ate this food. This food allowed me to be more sattvic. So I eat that food tomorrow a little more. I do something else which didn't lead me on the right path. I remember that. And slowly build a personal practice that will lead me on the way. Now, as this smriti is happening and my practice is moving forward, a very interesting phenomenon called smaram happens. Smaram is my memory of the true quality of my being, which is there in the dharam. This gets revealed to me when the structures of the self start becoming thinner and thinner and start dissolving. So this is what is the real sense and insight of the end point. So this smaram which comes in flashes has to become the whole of me and fill me up com completely. That is samadhi prajna. So as my mind becomes more and more subtle, it's capable of looking at reality as is, resonating from within me with the reality as is, and therefore gain deeper and deeper and deeper insightful knowledge. Right? Pragna has a very specific meaning in yoga. Pragna in yoga means I'm able to see the movement and the emanation and manifestation of reality from its most subtle form, which is the Mula Prakriti, till its manifest form, which is Vishesha, or the world outside, and then going back and dissolving. So that's the whole path. And of course, Shraddha is needed for you to walk through the whole thing. And what you reach finally is, in yoga, it's this figure of Anantasayana. So even when we're praying, we pray to Anantaya Nagaraja Namo Namaha. So this is the form. Yeah. And then one has to go beyond the form to the formless, which is Nibbija Samadhi. The other critical idea in Shraddha is like Nandi, na? Dirgha Kala, which means it's not going to happen soon. It's, dir it's a long time of practice. Nairantarya. You don't stop and start. You don't do something here and then run off to some other practice, run off to some other practice. You take up a practice and that's where Shraddha comes in. You invest in that practice with complete full heart and stay on the path. The one good thing is even if you have temporary setbacks, when you get back into the practice, the force of the practice will quickly take you back to where you stop. Yeah. Satkara is to find those actions, like I said before, which are going to lead you on the path. And all of this is done with tremendous respect, both to the path and to the end point. And in a sense of service. Yeah. So all of this, when persisted with, is what is going to take you through. The other very important idea in the Yoga Sutra is the idea called Yatha Abhimata Dhyanadva. Now, Abhimatam is also a term that is used because it says all the prakritis are not the same. Certain kinds of understanding of the path, a certain kind of understanding of the Godhead, Ishvara, will resonate with some people in one way, it will resonate with other people in a different way. So choose that path which really fills your heart with preeti for that path, which fills you with love for that path, and follow that path, yata abhimata dhyanadva. And these are the basic ideas around Shraddha. Yeah, and because the whole path is looked at as a Samudra Manthan, na? and remember in the Samudra Manthan, the Devas were required until the Amrita came up finally. So the, the parts of ourselves which are on the Satkara, on the 
positive and the other more asuric parts are going to be there till the end and the final dissolution happens. So Shraddha is not something which you require only in the beginning or somewhere in the middle. It's something that's required till the end, till the final Amrita comes up and then you get completely absorbed in Kaivalya. Yes, Nathan. Thank you, Raghuji, yeah, for a wonderful presentation. I can Please stop close. sharing. Please stop sharing. Yeah. I'm just going to stop sharing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I think uh, it's a very important and a very practical oriented presentation that how Ishwara Pranidana, what is actually its role and the way of the Shalata and Bhakti comes in the practice of yoga. And uh, this is a very important insight uh, that uh, you have shared. Uh, uh, and uh, I had a question uh, about this, the Uttama Adhikaris that you mentioned in the beginning, uh, that uh, where the pr Ishwar Pranidhana is not needed is what you said, I, I believe. Or, uh, See, I this is, uh, Nitin, this is a common misunderstanding and a common charcha, Nitin. It's not that Ishwara Pranidhana is not required. It's exactly like some other uh, person was saying. Na? This chap who is a Bhava Pratyaya sees Ishwara the moment it's pointed out to him. So why does he need Ishwara Pranidhana? Uh, he does not. Mm -hmm. So he goes straight into that. Okay. There's another explanation. No, In Sankhya itself, there are three types of Sankhya. One Sankhya that equates Mola Prakriti and Purusha as the foundation. One that says Purusha and Prakriti. And another uh, Sankhya thing that talks about an Ishwara which is beyond these two. Yoga Sutra talks about that Ishwara. Purusha Vishesha Ishwara. Yeah, but these are all charcha based things, Nitin. Okay, and Krishnamacharya was very clear. Charcha doesn't lead to practice. You are in Kali Yuga. You need Ishwara. You <laughs> figure out, yes, he was very clear about it. You figure out whether you're the kind of person who can pray to the tattva itself. Do you need a vigraha? What do you need? And completely dedicate yourself. Okay. But Raghu, uh, my, my, yes, my, my issue is you, you are quoting this example of Nirishwara and, and uh, 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 saying that uh, 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 Ishwara is not required. But even... I didn't if, say that. Yes, that is, that is how you presented it. No, 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 no. Go, go back slowly, Hari. If you have that kind of mind, which by the first touch of the Guru or in Shankara's case, whatever that uh, incident he goes through in the river, immediately he sees God. No, but that is the Purva Jarma Sukruta. No? That is exactly. Not the... That is the so... Bhava Pratyaya, no? So, but means in the previous lifetime, they had to go through the, uh, the earlier stages. That's what I said. Na? So, therefore, at any point in time, Ishwara is a sine qua non. It's not, it, you cannot, you cannot bypass it. If not this lifetime in the previous lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's the Bhava Pratyaya. Na? How did you get to become a Bhava Pratyaya? Through a practice, you had that Prakriti you passed away or you suspended. There is another thing in Yoga Sutra of what the Bhava Pratyaya is. And then you choose to be born. But when you choose to be born, the possibility of an Avarana, some kind of covering coming because you've taken this body, you may not immediately see the Ishwara inside you. You may not see the Jiva inside you. For which you require some external trigger which is in the form of a, of a guru, an enlightened guru or something. And the guru knows where your practice needs to start. What is your prakriti like? 
So either from sometimes just the sight of the guru, I know a couple of people who said that I went, I saw this person, immediately I had this enlightened state. The guru didn't even talk to them. They just looked at this chap straight. They looked at him and this person had a, a transcendental experience. So basically that's mean? an outlier. What you're saying is an outlier. Right? Those are they outliers. Don't make, they don't make the rule. So, they so, don't make the rule. So the so rule the larger is, point with Ishwara is a, is a, is a prerequisite uh, in, in Yoga Sutras. It's a, that's the point. Yes and no, Hari. I'm not going to let go so easily. I'll tell you why. No, but I'll tell why? you why. No, I'll tell you why. See, uh, as a yoga teacher, I'll, I'm telling you the practicalities of it. No? As a yoga teacher, somebody comes to me and says they want to learn yoga and invariably, they'll say back pain, neck pain. That's why I'm coming to you. I teach them something. Back pain is removed. Neck pain is removed. They go away, period. Then there are other people who will come and say, you know, I need to be a little less stressed, X, Y, Z. Not just back pain, shoulder pain. They're willing to listen to something more, some little more pranayama they learn, little more deeper things they will learn. Once they have they made themselves what they think is a better instrument for going and exploiting the world, they'll run away from you. Then there are other people. We ask them, you know, do you have a faith in God? What God do you have faith in? These are people who are generally have much greater depth of understanding of dharma. Okay. See, that's it. That's live a, a different a... life. That's then you have a whole different starting point. <clears throat> no, Raghu, I, I, I disagree. That's a teaching. So what we are discussing is whether, whether Shraddha and Bhakti is required in Yoga Sutras or not. It purpose. is. Huh, that's it a is. limited point. Now yeah, you decide. That I've already to answered. No, no, because no, no, because you have. You no, know, uh, this is in reference to our discussions. Because you are bringing out again the Nirishwara part. As if to now uh, portray that, look, there is that Nirishwara part also that is possible. Yes. Right? But, but no, no, but that Nirishwara part is possible only for those people who have been through the first uh, stage, so to speak, whether right. in this lifetime or the previous lifetime. So it's for the Bhava Pratyaya. That's what I huh. said. Hari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I want huh. to be clear on that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, that is clearly stated. Yeah, the Charcha around. Yoga Sutra comes because people don't apply this Bhava Pratyaya rule for the first set of sutras and call it based on Nirishwara Sankhya and there's a whole dialogue and debate about it. I mean, Nagaraji and all will know, Nitin and Jay Raman will know much more about this charcha than I do because I don't get into this charcha. But it is a fact. We can't run away from the fact that this is the way it has been interpreted but Krishnamacharya's interpretation is very clearly that this is meant for a bhava pratyaya. That's not how everybody interprets it, by the way. A lot of people still have that question about the first 20 odd sutras. And he's also said that in Kali Yuga, you must have Ishwara Pranidhana. But what is the form of Ishwara that you can resonate with will differ with, depending on the prakriti. And then of your course. practice will also differ based on that. Yeah, that is fair enough. That is fair enough. I mean, uh, th that's fair enough. Nagaraj Garu, do you want to weigh in on this? <laughs> <laughs> this is one. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're muted. Yes, Nagaraj Ji, I'd love to hear you on this. Now, this whole debate has started uh, because, uh, uh, because of... Uh, 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 I was ostracized when I said that. Look, this is uh, devotion and uh, and shraddha is is important. I was ostracized. So this whole let me, not let me uh, just share. Let, let me just share data. Uh, there was a yogi in Hampi uh, who was known for his uh, vibhutis. Also, he achieved vibhutis. And myself, my father, and all our team met him. And we saw some of his vibhutis. He was able to stop monkeys. When they were entering the ashram, when we were all going, we were all scared. And uh, just with his 
iron movement he stopped all the monkeys they were actually made into statues they they were immobilized and they then moved when he ordered then we went inside and said oh you have to do this everything then my father said uh, what is your experience we were discussing he when he narrated his inner experiences the light that he saw the nirbija samadhi that he was into everything then my father said what do you want to call it then he said why should i call it ishwara um it is your word uh you give it a word if you want to give it a word ishwara give it but i don't want to give it i'm not interested in giving it uh and uh, then he said uh, you have all come from virupaksha temple you are interested in those idols and your idol worshipers i'm not yoga is not idol worshiping i am just a yogi and we have an entire school of uh, what can be called a yoga movement who were icon class they were agnest idol worship they were agnest uh, bhakti they were agnest temple going and all that there are n number of uh, songs lyrics written by them agnest idol worship agnest uh, all this and today when they do academic studies of these uh, lyrics and this material and all that if they are coming from left side if they are coming from hindu phobic uh, thinking they get elated looking at this ah oh, wow these are the people yes they are scolding uh, rituals they are scolding uh, you know uh, temple they are scolding bhakti they are scolding idols wonderful people so these are our predecessors they think and they say see this is what is being actually this reality of people like us in the hindu tradition that are being hidden by the present uh, hindu minded academicians it is there that that approach is not absent it's there in uh, siddha literature also na tamil yes, siddha in, in tamil siddha literature there, there's a whole tradition of this there is a, a whole group of people who in fact form part of the hindu tradition itself correct but uh, they appear to be icono class they appear to be uh, against some ishwara kind of thing and all that what happens is today when uh, we are addressing contemporary audience because i from the morning i have been repeating this we are getting educated from the experience of uh, the emergence of modernity uh, from europe that emergence of modernity was happening because of a clash between faith and science and faith was stoning science galileo was stoned galileo was jailed copernicus was harassed because of the faith and the theocracy the king was controlled by the faith so that led to in the european tradition and the europe born enlightenment tradition which is the origin of our university academics there has been this very stringent clash between science and faith so because we are coming from there whenever we see somebody opposing faith we jump at it we elate, we are elated we get excited and say ah oh, these are the people. these yogis these are our people okay. these are uh, these are very similar to us and all that this uh, all this is coming from a misunderstanding of the actual vedic tradition on the vedic side the faith versus science uh, uh, binary itself does not apply because it, it is the uh, uh, the shastra scholars like tulsi kumar joshi ji jamalamadaka srinivas uh, garu 
Yamal Mata Surinarayan Garu. All the Shastra scholars from the morning repeatedly said that, and Aditi Banerjee's uh, presentation also has the same that Shraddha is not a blind faith. Correct. And there is this Ishwara being imagined to be some god with big bold eyes being looking from the sky downwards and controlling all of us kind of thing. And the god coming from a book in which you have to have a blind faith because the book asks you to believe. You know, there is this cyclic lo circular logic that you have to believe in that god because the book asks you to believe. Why should you believe in that asking of the book? Because the book is also asking you to believe. Uh, so that circular logic in that God is being unnecessarily getting universalized. Right. And people, when they look at Ishwara, they think that we are talking about that kind of a God. Can I just add something here, Nagaraji? Exactly what you're saying. Na? Krishnamacharya would continuously say, when I'm talking about Ishwara, be very careful about Vikalpa about Ishwara and having Dharana on the right figures. And he would say, the pictures drawn by Ravi Verma are Vikalpa. When you go to a Vigraha that is done properly, the mathematics and the proportion of the Vigraha is what is impacting you. Take that in. That is what will protect you. So any, you have to be careful about the choice also. So yeah. he would clearly say, don't go for Vikalpa. It's very easy to get caught with Vikalpa. It doesn't matter if you start, but be careful. Exactly what you're saying. Well, I'll give you Shastriya examples of uh, how we can see how Shastra looks at Ishwara. For example, in Nyaya, there is a discussion about the relationship between word and meaning, Shabda and Artha. And the modern linguist say, uh, linguistics says that the relationship between word and meaning is not created by us human beings. It is arbitrary. Uh, the word and meaning relationship has come in very arbitrary. But in Vyakarana Sampradaya, in Vakya Padiyam, Bhaktari says that the relationship between word and meaning is a convention. Correct. It is a collective convention. It is an unconscious collective contribution by all the speakers. So when I say that I am not the one who has given the meaning for this word, I am just saying that I am not singly contributing to the meaning of the word. The meaning of the word has been contributed collectively, unconsciously through the convention of all the speakers, even before me. So this collective uh, unconscious contribution by the speakers apart from me, from the previous generations also, if all this together is given a name, that is Ishwara. That is what Nyaya is saying. Nyaya is saying that it is Ishwara Kratam Nirmay. I am Shabdasya, I am Artham, it is Ishwara Kratam Nirmay. This is, Ishwara Kratam means if you are imagining that there is a Lord who says that uh, let there be trees, then there were trees, let there be light, there was light kind of God, and he created, let there be this meaning for this word, then that is superstitious. That is based on a blind faith. Correct. But when we are saying that there is a logic, there is a convention, there is a collective unconscious contribution by all the speakers. And if I have to visualize this collective ability, collective power of all the collective unconscious contribution by all the speakers, then I would give that the name Ishwara. But uh, Nagaraji, there is also this idea of spotana, that there are some key words which intrinsically refer to a reality, like Om. Na? Th that is Ajasra Shabda. That is ah. uh, in Vyabharana. So that's they, they that's also that critical. Na? Yeah, that because is. That, in, that in, is connection in, with modern... Ishwara, no, in connection with Ishwara, the Yoga Sutra ends with Tat Japaha Tadartha Bhavanam, saying chant Om. Yes, yes. And the word Om contains within it the reality of the Om. 
Correct, exactly. So that Ajasratva is matching only with Om. Uh, Shabda is Artha. That is, Om is the Dhyaya and Om is the Dhyana Art. and Om is the Dhyata also. Dhyata. Is, right. So the Tripiti, so there that is Ajasra. And they, in modern uh, studies of communication and linguistics, they use the word iconicity. So whenever the word and meaning are the same, the word communicates itself, they say that it is an iconic, it is iconicity. And that iconicity is also there. But this iconicity also forms part of the larger mechanism of that uh, being beyond the individual ability of an individual. So that everything that is happening in reality, which is beyond the individual ability of the individual, is the process called Ishvara. So when you are saying you are uh, doing pranidhana to Ishvara, you are actually recognizing the reality that you are you do not have the kartrutva for the entire process, which includes your process. There is a larger process in which you are part. And the recognition that you are just part of that whole process is the pranidhana. So uh, from a very mundane point of view, from a very mundane experience, people may think that it is a surrenderance. It is submission. You are obedient. You are falling at the feet of someone. Uh, you are being oppressed by him, you are being hegemonized by him, you are being controlled by that person and all that. This is a misunderstanding coming from uh, a day-to-day -day experience of what people think that you are accepting the process. Actually, when Yoga Sutras say that uh, you you are able to understand the language of birds if you actually uh, empathize with the birds as one of the vibhutis. What it is saying is that gradually you have to identify with the process called Ishwara. So that uh, when you are doing more and more empathy, with greater and greater empathy, what you are doing is you are getting absorbed. That absorption is pranidhan. Yeah, sahridayatva of that, na? Yeah, sahridayatva. Spandana, the spandana of the object and the spandana inside you become the same, na? That is samadhi, no? That is samadhi. That is pranidhana also. That is pranidhana. That Ishwara is also. Pranidhana Ishwara and pranidhana is samadhi only. Yeah, Ishwara pranidhana is samadhi in the concept of sarvam kalvidam brahma. Sarvam kalvidam brahma. That's what so, I said, no, that Hiranya Garba thing. That's very yeah. difficult also, na, Nagaraji. Mm -hmm. A normal person, that Hiranya Garbha is manifest everywhere, is a very superior idea, no? So the spandhana happens usually with some vigraha, which they feel very close to, and so on. So that becomes the starting point. That's what Krishnamacharya is saying. And there he is warning us, saying, don't take this... Uh, uh, calendar heart to be your representation. Go to your Kuladevam. Go to your particular god or goddess. Make sure that Vikraha is sculpted properly. In organizational behavior, in, in, an, in a com company management, in co corporate behavior, in organizational behavior, if you tell an employee that if he keeps owning ownership for every activity, which is a collective process of the whole company, he will be unnecessarily sued for every activity of the company. Correct. So for him to be safe, it is always safe to disown. Own only to the extent that he is responsible. Then this process of owning only to the extent the, to which he is responsible is what is called as Ishwara Pranidhana. The company's collective process is Ishwara. And he is just allowing himself to be just part of it. That is a very clever and political, diplomatic way of escaping from getting sued. <laughs> this is a beautiful idea, Naharaj <laughs>
<laughs> so so if the dhanavas do something i don't have to be responsible for it yeah see there, there is there is everything happening from all other employees of the company why should i say i am doing everything I, I, i can say that i just surrendered the whole process of the company and just part of it i am doing whatever bit i am responsible for please don't sue me for everything that happens in the company that's the, that's a nice way of looking that is a surrender that is pranidhana <coughs> that is ishwara pranidhana so with this analogy we can say that the company called cosmos this is a cosmic company it is a huge company that is running and if that company is being run by itself that self running by the cosmos as a company can make it parama atman that is parama atman but if you look at that agency which is running the whole cosmic company company called cosmos that is called ishwara even if the md or the ceo or the chief director of the company unnecessarily owns a responsibility for anything he unnecessarily gets sued for it so it is better it is safe for the even the md to say that the entity called company is doing the whole thing i am responsible only to the extent that i am responsible on paper that is ishwara pranidhan nagraj any more comments uh, i think you have already shared lot of your thoughts on yes, the... yes, correct. yes yes correct yes, yeah. yeah so uh, and uh, most of the things uh, that i wanted to say were covered by aditi ji also so i think you can move on to uh, uh, your vote of thanks and okay uh thank Adi you Kiran, Garu, uh, you, you asked me to respond so if you are if you have anything to say no no thank you thank you he's yes. very happy nagraj ji <laughs> <laughs> but i never ostracized you hari ji <laughs> i was subtly giving the same point thank you ragaji uh, for the wonderful presentation uh, very nuanced presentation